Have you ever heard of Soroya? Well, if you were in New York in 1908, you could have queued round the block to see his exhibition. But he's, after his death in 1923, he started to go out of fashion and um, never returned to fashion. Although perhaps the exhibition of his work at the National Gallery in London in 2019 will help to reinstate him as one of the, the greatest Spanish artists. Joaquin Soroya y Bastida was born in Valencia, where many of his beach scenes were painted. This photograph is his house in Madrid, which is also the museum of his work. And I, I took the photograph a few years ago, and that's when I, I was first introduced to his work. This is Soroya. It's a self-portrait that he painted when he was 41. Notice the intensity of his gaze. He is an artist that paints what he sees and has been described as the Spanish artist with a photographer's eye. He painted from life rather than from photographs and he painted uh, many aspects of Spain. It's the country and its customs. He was orphaned when he was two. Both of his parents died in the 1865 cholera epidemic and he was brought up by his uncle, who was a blacksmith. His uncle uh, luckily recognised his talent and encouraged him to go to drawing classes, which he did at a local trade school. And by the age of 15, he could bash out a still life in the style of the masters. His talent was recognised early on and he exhibited in Madrid in his early teens and his first large history painting was bought by the Spanish government before he was even 21. He had an extraordinary technical ability. He can represent any figure, texture, object, fall of light that he wishes to, as we'll see in the paintings. But he started out uh, slightly differently. This painting is called Another Marguerite. He saw a woman being transported to prison in a third-class carriage when he was travelling between Madrid and Valencia. So it's, it's based on experience, although um, what he did is he actually hired a railway carriage and used models when he painted the picture to get the details right. Note the shackles on her wrist. She's being a prisoner being transported to prison and it's a an image of suffering and despair the title another marguerite refers to the the woman in goethe's play faust who um, faust with the help of the devil seduces the the innocent marguerite who is sometimes her name is abbreviated to Gretchen in the play. And she gives birth to a child that eventually uh, she drowns the illegitimate child and is convicted of murder. So it's uh, this reference to Goethe's play was added later by Soroya. The painting was exhibited in Madrid where it was awarded a gold medal and it was then sent to Chicago to the World Fair in 1893, where it won first prize. And it was bought by the Washington Museum in St. Louis, which is um, where it still is. As a result of this painting and others, he rose to fame and was regarded as the leading Spanish painter. He decided that um, early on that he was going to be a famous artist, not just in Spain, not just in Europe, but worldwide. So he had big ambitions and painted modern themes like this one and exhibited at world fairs to consciously uh, become famous on the world stage. From the 1890s, his um, work was exhibited at a, an endless series of international exhibitions he was commissioned for portraits, honours were showered upon him 
and he travelled ceaselessly, so by 1900 he was considered the most famous of all living Spanish artists. This painting's called, and they still say fish is expensive. It shows a scene inside a fishing boat where a young boy has been seriously injured. The young boy is wearing a medallion, a good luck medallion, round his neck, while his shoulders are held by one fisherman and the other applies a wet compress to his stomach, which he's um, soaked in the pail of water in the foreground. Around them, they're surrounded by fishing tackle in the background. There's a pile of fish that they caught during the unfortunate day's work. It's um, a work that, um, like the previous work, is making a, a moral point where it got a, a lot of favourable publicity, different from his later paintings. The title is taken from the final passage of a novel called The Mayflower, which was published about the same time. And in the novel, it's about the, the novels about the wretched lives of of fishermen and it does end with a story which is similar to the accident that um, is shown depicted here by Soraya. This is called The Return from Fishing but unlike the previous painting it doesn't make a moral point. It's um, showing the sort of scene that um, Soraya would have been very familiar with. He was um, it was it was painted in Valencia and he was born and grew up in Valencia so he was very familiar with these beach scenes this um uh, notice this is a very large painting it's um, 4 meters wide and the oxen who are pulling in the fishing boat are life size he painted it in 1894 when he was um 31 and it was exhibited in Paris and won a second class medal which was um a remarkable achievement for a foreign artist and it was bought by the French state from the exhibition for 6,000 francs. It was an immediate success among conservative critics who admired its technical prowess. They commented on the contrast between the dark oxen and the bright sea, the accuracy of the semi-transparent sail and notice there the, the way that he's handled the, the colour contrast between the, the buttery yellow sail that's backlit by the sun alongside the, um, the dirty blue uh, of the sail where it's in partial shade. It was, these um, technical skills were, as I said, much admired by critics at the time. He was following in the, the academic tradition with a well-balanced composition, high finish, uh, restrained colours, but um, accurate representation of colours, shapes, forms and so on. The success of the previous painting and the positive critical reaction led him to paint many variations over the next few years. This is Beaching the Boat Afternoon Light which he painted three years later. Although in reproduction it looks similar to the previous painting, it's actually much more dynamically painted. It's a bravura paint performance. It's paint dashed onto the canvas, as you can see if you look closely. He used a wide variety of colours, a wide variety of brush strokes, from small to broad. The paint is dabbed in places, smeared, scrawled onto the canvas. Soraya is obviously much more confident in this painting, much more free and relaxed in its production. And although it looks like a sketch, it's a very large painting. It's 4.4 metres. It's larger than the previous painting we saw. It's in some places, you can see the canvas coming through. In other places, it's thick, impasto paint. Soraya painted some of these, he, he did a lot of sketching, a lot of planning, but he also painted directly from life and he would take his easel and canvas and paints 
onto the beach, as we'll see in the next painting. A final beach scene for now. It's called Afternoon at the Beach in Valencia. And he's adopted a high viewpoint looking down at some boys playing in the sea, looking down so that the horizon is above the top of the painting. So all we see is the sea a little bit in the foreground of some rocks. And at the top of the picture, the um, umbrella or parasol that um, he would sit under while he was painting for hours in the midday sun on the beach. The picture shows us some boys playing and it's painted even more freely than the last picture, what um, you might call an impressionistic style. He uh, wrote to a friend that he intended this as a study in light and in the letter he went on to quote Monet, we painters, however, can never reproduce sunlight as it really is. I can only approach the truth of it, which is what we see him doing here. The, in fact, Monet, Degas and Rodin probably saw this painting when it was exhibited and we don't know what they thought of it. We do know Degas stared intently at each of Soroya's paintings in turn and then left without saying a word. I'm not sure what the significance of that is. A very well-known painting by Soroya called Sewing the Sail. Again, it was painted in Valencia, this time in a hut near the beach. We can see the, uh, the sea through the door in the background. This perhaps is uh, Soroya's most complex representation of light. As the sun filters through the trellis, we get patches of light on the on the sail that's being sewn, some of it in shadow, some of it in bright sunlight, some of it direct sun, some of it in, in indirect sun. We get patches of cream and grey. In, in fact, Soraya was aware of the, the complexity of the painting. He wrote to a friend, I'm not sending you any photographs because they do not do justice to its tonal relations. You have to see the painting to appreciate the, um, the the play of light and the way that he's captured it. It's got a um, conventional pyramidal composition, but um, the, the figures unusually are pushed to the background and what dominates is the sail itself. It was exhibited at the Paris Salon where it won first prize and it won first prize in Munich and Vienna. Although when it was exhibited in Madrid, some critics felt it didn't have a strong composition, perhaps because the figures were pushed to the background and they were also concerned that um, there, was, there wasn't any moral or spiritual message behind the painting. In 1905, it was exhibited at the Venice Biennale, where it was very well received and was in fact bought by Venice itself and it's still there. This is the the last of his big paintings with a social theme. It's called Sad Inheritance and it shows a, a group of disabled, blind and deaf young boys on the beach being um, led to the sea <coughs> Excuse me, by the monk that looks after them. It was sent to the 1900 Paris Universal Exhibition where it, it won the Grand Prix and initiated huge discussion at the time. The painting uh, beat Whistler, Klimt and Alma Tadema at the, the exhibition in Paris. It's still, in fact, controversial today. It was um, placed at one point in a church in New York as a form of altarpiece demonstrating an act of, chari an act of charity. However, it was never bought by the, the Spanish state, perhaps because it um, exhibits the highlights, the disabilities of some of its young Spanish citizens. As I said, it, although it was the last of the big paintings with a social theme, it was one of many paintings that he continued to paint of um, people and children 
playing on the beach, one of his um, favourite subjects, as we'll see. But um, by this time, by 1899, his career was changing because by this time he was happily married. In 1888, when he was 25, he returned to Valencia to marry Clotilde, who he'd first met in 1879 while he was working in his father's studio. Sorry, in her father's studio. She became his muse and the subject of many of his paintings, and they had a, a happy marriage and a passionate relationship when he was away from her which happened often as he travelled the world. He would write every day, often enclosing a flower. One In one of his letters he wrote, All my love is focused on you. You are my body, my life, my mind, my perpetual ideal. By um, 1895, when this was painted, they had had three children together. Maria, born in 1890. Joaquin, born in 1892. And Eleanor, shown here, his youngest daughter, born in 1895. In 1890, they moved to Madrid, where for the next 10 years, Soraya spent his time focused mainly on the production of large canvases, oriental themes, mythological, historical and social subjects, with the intent to display them in salons, international exhibitions all, all around the world, Madrid, Paris, Venice, Munich, Berlin, Chicago, and so on. He had a happy marriage. The biographer's curse, it's often said, no mistresses, no hidden secrets as far as we know. What we see here is his wife, Clotilde, and their, his youngest daughter, Eleanor. Originally, when he painted it, his wife's head was turned the other way, but around 1900, about um, five years after he first painted it, he rethought the picture and painted her head round the other way to look at the baby. It's a, it's a master work in white. The white bedclothes, the grey walls, enable Soraya to experiment with shades of white, perhaps um, inspired by Whistler's Symphony in White, Number one, the white girl. The the white and the sleeping baby signify purity, but he I think he avoids sentimentality by the unusual composition and the technical virtuosity. Our eye is is drawn to the handling of so many shades of white rather than from the, the sentimental appearance of mother and child. Incidentally, his his daughter Eleanor grew up to become a uh, Spanish sculptor and painter herself. And after a, a brief career, she left art behind to dedicate herself to her family after her marriage. Soria saw himself as participating in the, the great Spanish tradition. And when he was in um, England, he went to see the Rockby Venus, uh, which at the time was a Rockby Park in County Durham uh, by Diego Velasquez, uh, also called the Toilet of Venus. He studied the picture and he realised that he could um, take on Velasquez. So he painted this, which is modelled by his wife. Because it's his wife, he never showed it in public as a portrait, but he did exhibit it in 1909 called simply Female Nude, uh, but he never sold it. It's interesting comparing him to Velázquez, perhaps the greatest uh, Spanish painter. Towards the end of his life, he admitted that how tired he felt um, and how he wanted to go further. He, he wrote, Anxiety is what most consumes me in life. I don't have Velázquez's phlegm. Maybe that is where his perfection and my lack of it lies. When Soroya went to Rokeby Hall to see the Toilet of Venus by Velasquez, he went with this uh, well-known artist, Aureliano de Beruete, and um, this is 
a portrait of the artist that he painted from life, one of his um, better known portraits. The only indication that uh, Berrette is an artist is the picture in the background on an easel. He's sitting there with his gloves still on, holding a hat, with his coat just taken off as if he's just come in from, from a walk. The style of the painting is similar to the style or in the tradition of Velasquez. And um, Soraya described the technique he used as for, por for portraits as painting from inside out, never seeming to search for the outline or silhouette. You might contrast this with drawing the outline of the face first and then filling it in with colour. What Soroya is saying is he, did, he does the opposite. He works from the inside of the face. He builds up the face, in other words, component by component, uh, filling in and creating the personality as he paints. Uh, and a bit like um, Sargent, he's also re used a, a reduced palette. Here he's using black, grey and beige to paint the, the picture. He painted this in 1902 and, as I said, he became a famous artist around about uh, 1900 and everybody wanted their portrait painting. It was a, it was a time when um, portrait painting had um, re received a revival. It was, for an artist, the most lucrative and ar arguably, however, the most competitive genre. Although he painted a few portraits before 1900, portraiture quickly became his um, his forte, his signature subject, along with beach scenes. This is a portrait of the American artist Ralph Clarkson. It was painted when Soraya went to Chicago and he was received there as a, a famous artist, as the, the Prince of Painting, as he was called. He painted this uh, portrait in just two hours, as did Velasquez, a spontaneous approach which enabled him to, to capture the person, the personality. He studied the, um, the old masters, in particular, in particular Velasquez, although he did feel that um, sticking cl too closely to their style would be detrimental. He, he said at one point about the old masters, painting isn't any use for painting today, to be honest. Although he did make an exception for the painting we can actually see in the background here for the great things, such as Las Meninas by the great Velasquez. Clarkson uh, first saw Soroya's work when he visited Madrid in 1891, but they'd, he didn't actually meet Soroya until we think about 1900, when Clarkson was on the jury of the Paris Universal Exhibition. Remember I said that um, Soroya's sad inheritance won the Grand Prix prize. Well, Clarkson was on the uh, jury that awarded the prize. And it was following that visit to Paris that um, Clarkson made a large copy of Velasquez Las Meninas when he returned to Chicago. And that's what you can see hanging on his studio wall behind him. This is a portrait of his wife and favourite model, Clotilde Garcia del Castillo, who he called um, my flesh, my life, my brain. She was his confidant, travelling companion, bookkeeper and muse. And this portrait is set in their Madrid home. She's wearing a striking evening dress and behind her is a painting by Soraya of a female saint made uh, th that he painted during the first years of their marriage. And it can't be any coincidence that the halo around the saint's head is very close to being around the head of his wife. Now, it's worth taking an aside here to explain why 
it was owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In it, This was painted in 1906. In 1908, he exhibited in London, but he wasn't a success, not at all. He didn't sell many paintings. He got some bad critical reviews, uh, no commissions, but he did meet a, um, a wealthy American a patron, Archer Huntington, who invited him to exhibit the following year in New York. The exhibition in New York was a sensation. They were lined up round the block in the snow. 160,000 people visited in a month. He sold 195 paintings and received 25 portrait commissions, including being invited to the White House to paint President Taft. All the museums in America had to have a Soroya and that's when, after that exhibition, the, this painting was sold to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where it's still on display. Also, as a result of uh, this success, he was commissioned to paint a, a series, a 60-metre mural painting, a series of paintings of Spanish costumes and customs, and it, it more or less occupied Soroya for the rest of his life. It could be described as, as his ruin because of the, the effort it took out of him. A, a final um, take on this painting is that we have a photograph of uh, Soroya sketching the um, portrait of his wife before um, he starts the painting. Incidentally, when he visited London, he did meet um, John Singer Sargent and they became uh, friends and, and friendly competitors. Critics were always comparing the two artists, comparing and contrasting them. In um, 1904, he painted this portrait of his three children. At that stage, the eldest in the red dress is 14-year-old Maria, 12-year-old Jockin is wearing the grey suit and the white cravat and looking like a, an adult dandy. And nine-year-old Eleanor seems bored by the, the whole painting session. E incidentally, X-ray analysis shows that he did paint his wife, Clotilde, in front of the children and later painted her, them out, painted her out, sorry, perhaps to emphasise the children's independence. We can see uh, elements of uh, or references to Velasquez again in this painting. The edge of the canvas on the right is a, a reference to the, the canvas in Las Meninas. There is a uh, what appears to be a mirror in the background, as there also is in Las Meninas, all um, references that would have been picked up to the great uh, Velasquez. Let's return to his other great passion, beach scenes. Uh, when he left London in 1908, he went back to Spain to paint scenes like this for uh, America, the American exhibition. And this arguably is his most famous painting, Boys on the Beach, which is in the, the Prado. It's one of a number of reclining nudes on the beach that he painted from life with his easel at the water's edge. There are, there are even traces of sand in many of his paintings. It's, the painting itself is dated 1910, but we believe it was painted in the summer of 1909 when we know he stayed in Valencia between late June and late September that year. The 
the composition is combines the static pose of the boys resting on the beach with their dynamic alignment. The diagonal of the nearest boy takes our eye up to the, the horizontal second boy and the movement is stopped by the, the third horizontal relaxed figure. It's a view looking downward so the horizon is very high. All we see is the swirling sea and sand. The um, figures occupy the whole canvas and it involves us in the picture the 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 tones of uh, the skin tones of the boys we can we can see that he's picked up the the lighter whiter tones of the nearest boy whose skin is dried and the the next boy has got slightly darker tones a wetter body with the sea swirling around his feet you can see the uh, indentations in the sand of created by the swirling water have just been captured by a few swirls of the brush you also notice the um, the reflection of the boy's body distorted by the undulations of the sand and the contrast between that and the dark violet shadows underneath their bodies indicating a fierce midday sun. This is the white boat, Javier. It was painted in 1905 when Soraya had uh, spent a summer holiday in uh, Javier, which is a coastal town about 100 kilometres from Valencia. He painted it from a high vantage point, possibly a nearby cliff, and you can see the boys are straining to pull in the boat. Their bodies are painted in a, a thick, creamy impasto that becomes a translucent green under the water. The deep blue water surrounding them is a, a blue priming layer covered in dashes of emerald green, blue, turquoise, white and yellow. And the, the dark blue and turquoise in the foreground suggests that um, there are rocks underneath that the boys are holding on to to pull in the boat. The boat, you can just make out the name, its name is Rayo, meaning lightning implying speed. All the following paintings are presented chronologically up to the end of his life, starting with Shadow on Alcantara Bridge, Toledo in 1906. The, the bridge which spans the Tagus River across to Toledo is a um, famous bridge. It was built originally built by the Romans in uh, 104 to 106 AD, although it has been destroyed and rebuilt many times since then. Soro Soroya visited Toledo a number of times and uh, he, he wrote, If not Madrid, those of us who make painting our life should live here. There is nothing equal to it in Italy or Belgium. He loved the city. Many paint, he painted many paintings, some, some 20 paintings of the city, uh, mostly from unusual angles and viewpoints. I've given you um, a chance to, to look at this painting to make out what it is. So let me um, uh, clarify. It's um, the underneath of the bridge looking across the river the golden arc on the left is the sunlight coming under one of the arches of the bridge we see the diagonal cutting across the painting is the shadow of the bridge falling across the river creating a powerful dark blue shape at the bottom the golden reflections are rocks that break up the shadow and on the far side we see the the rocks of the bank made up of strong vertical and horizontal brush strokes of creams pinks and violets you can see from this painting that um, by 1906 he was becoming more and more experimental it's uh, when you first see it it's not clear what you're looking at, that it's a reflection of the arch of the bridge across the water. But uh, as soon as you realise what it is, it, it snaps into place. 
you'll also notice that his um, brushwork is becoming freer and freer. The following year, in 1907, he spent the summer at the Royal Palace of La Grandia de San Ildefonso. It's about 80 kilometres north of Madrid, and he was there to paint a portrait of the King and Queen. In between sittings, he painted his family playing in the garden, and this is the fountain of the snail, and he's painted his youngest daughter, the girl on the right, Eleanor, skipping around the fountain with her friends. It has a um, spontaneity, a photographic spontaneity. He's captured her in midair skipping. The skipping rope is just a faint single line of white paint behind her. And the painting itself is dynamic strokes mimicking the girl's energy in skipping. The, um, the, the, uh, the painting itself is alternately some thick paint strokes and, it, and in places we can see the canvas behind the paint which gives the painting a lot of energy. It's also, as I mentioned, something to do with photography as before the snapshot it's difficult to think someone would paint someone apparently floating in the air but with the, um, the advent of the Kodak click and we do the rest camera which were now, which were uh, widely available in 1907 i think they were launched in the something like 1885 and it's it's changed the way people viewed the world so the girl floating in the air is clearly a, a snapshot of someone um, skipping Another beach painting, 1908, Running Along the Beach, one of his um, famous works. He, in 1908, he travelled to London and while he was there visiting an exhibition of his work at the Grafton Galleries, he went to the British Museum to study the Elgin Marbles and we that's what we see here. This is a, a reference to the figures on the Elgin Marbles there billowing draperies of the girls echo those of the figures in the Greek sculpture. The figures seem to fly across the margin between the sea and the sand and the warm coloured sand contrasts with the colder blue of the sea. As I said before, his exhibition in London wasn't particularly successful, even though he was advertised as the world's greatest living painter. It wasn't an instant success. He didn't sell many works. And as a consequence, the National Gallery in London, the Tate, uh, the major galleries around the country, don't have any Soroya paintings. There are many in American museums, but um, not in Britain. And if Soroya was discussed at all around uh, the 1900s, it was as a comparison to his friend, uh, fellow artist, John Singer Sargent. The following year he painted Strolling Along the Seashore, uh, one of his best known and iconic works. It was painted in Valencia in the summer of 1909 and it shows his wife Clotilde on the left and his eldest daughter Maria. They've, um, or Soraya had just returned from his triumphant success in New York, Buffalo and Boston and this painting reflects his bold, self-assured and refined uh, style. He was uh, by this time a mature artist in complete control. We see the pair walking casually along the beach, leaning slightly into the wind which blows their clothes back behind them and Soroya has captured the soft late afternoon sunlight. It's um, a daring photographic snapshot 
of the cut of the couple a, a moment in time you can see that by the um the way that Clotilde's hat is chopped off at the top like um a snapshot a photographic snapshot and the the extra large expanse of sand at the bottom the high viewpoint enabled him to eliminate the horizon and in doing so he can contrast the sea and the sand as a backdrop to the two figures and in painting the figures he's captured all of the nuances of white the different shades of white reflecting the the yellows of the sand and the blue of the sea contrasted with the darker coloured ribbons and flowers of the hat the painting is then tied together unified by the white line of surf at the top of the painting this is the drunkard Zeraus painted in 1910 as I mentioned previously in um, when he was in New York he was commissioned to paint an enormous mural altogether 210 square meters of wall representing the costumes and customs of Spain a project which occupied the rest of his life he had, as we've seen, been painting light-toned paintings for many years, beaches and happy times, and he realised that he had to get back to painting peasant life, the ancient traditions, and employ darker colours to represent the dark power of a Spanish painting. And he painted a whole series of dark Spanish scenes of working men enjoying themselves, sometimes perhaps a bit too much. Zarus is a, a small port, a small fishing village and seaside town in the Basque region on the northern coast near Bilbao. He spent a family holiday there in the town and perhaps because of bad weather he painted a number of scenes inside taverns, at least four of which are studies like this one of alcoholism. This was a, a serious problem because cider was abundant and cheap. This painting shows four people making fun of a local drunkard called Moscora. They're encouraging, encouraging him to drink more cider. You can see that the hand in front of him is the chap to, to his right, to our left, who's thrusting a glass forward for him to drink. Another drunk with a red nose to the left looks hard at Soroya. In between painting for the, the project, he painted um, beach scenes and his family. This is the siesta. He spent the summer of 1911 in the seaside town of San Sebastián in Spain's Basque region. And he stayed in the house of a, an old friend of his. And this was painted in the garden. It's a very large canvas, two metres square, which he uh, took out onto the lawn of the garden and painted from life and although it's not immediately obvious it's it snaps into place we can see that there are four women resting on the grass under the shade of the tree reclining across the painting is his wife Clotilde behind her are is their youngest daughter Eleanor apparently asleep and a friend called Maria Teresa who's a, a book publisher and he's shown she's shown engrossed reading a book and then further back on the right is their eldest daughter Maria her fingers playing with a, a wicker chair all painted um, uh, very loosely extremely uh, daring of painting some areas of the canvas uh, are, are bare others are thick impasto paint just to, sh to show you um, a close-up you can see uh, the um, the dress is thick strokes of paint and it's a mix of white orange pink yellow and blue sometimes painted wet on wet the, the wet color 
is painted on top of a colour that's already been painted which is still wet. In the foreground is it's a hat with a dark blue ribbon which is suggested by just a few brush strokes. Sarroyo travelled across Spain with a photographer to record local costumes for the mural he was working on in New York. This is uh, Roncal Valley in the Pyrenees in the Navarra region which is centred on Pamplona. Unusually we know the names of the models as they were written on the back of the photograph that was taken on the time. We know that on the left is Benita Daspar dressed in a costume that identifies her as a single woman with her head covered. To her left is her aunt Raimunda Monzon who as a married woman is dressed in dark clothes and the smart looking man on the right is Jose Sanz and his black cape with red trimmings shows that he's the mayor or a local councillor. The, the figures were used in the final mural but not in this arrangement. They're used um, as part of a ceremonial procession shown entering a church. The um, costumes they're wearing were not costumes that by this, by 1912, were regularly worn. Um, Soroya had to bring the costumes himself and uh, the, 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 the men and women modelled the clothes for him. He, and, and most of these images are life-size. He painted life-size images. The, the dress of the councilman particularly impressed Soroya. It, it, was, um, it had been unchanged since the Middle Ages. Soroya wrote to his wife, the men, the men are especially magnificent in their outfits, a vision of Spain that is impressive, noble and appealing. This is a few years later in 1906. It's called After the Bath, the Pink Robe. And he was engaged, deeply engaged in his project to paint the costumes and customs of ancient Spain for the Hispanic Society in New York. In order to take a break, to take a rest from this project, he spent the summer in Valencia painting uh, the local area. And um, what we see here is the time he spent the final few weeks of a summer, of that summer, in um, Valencia. And this was painted near the Malvarosa beach in Valencia. Soroya considered it a major work and one of the best I've ever produced. The two women have just returned from bathing and are in a beach hut and the, the furthest woman from us is helping the one in pink to remove her wet robe. We feel as though we are witnessing an intimate moment normally hidden from view and yet the, the triviality of the moment contrasts with the monumentality of the figures the, I think it must be the, the, the deeply folded drapes which reminds us of Greek dresses and gives the painting a classical timeless dimension. It's got the grandeur and stature of Greek sculpture, a permanence and a dignity. And we know that Soroya was deeply interested in ancient Greek sculpture. We see the, um, the sunlight streaming through the, the wicker walls and behind the the wall on the left we can see the sea in the distance. He's captured the sun in shades of white as it comes through the the walls catching the curtain as it blows towards the women on the left and we can see the bright streaks of sunlight dappling their um, the drapery there their clothing on the on the two women. It's uh, 1909 and Soraya had just finished the project for um, the uh, Hispanic Society in New York. 
This particular painting was commissioned by a wealthy American known as the Tobacco King, and it could be a reference to the smuggling of tobacco. It's called The Smugglers. Now, originally we know from sketches that he painted or sketched the men transporting the goods by donkey over a rough path, but obviously he spotted this um, this cliff face. He was um, on holiday in Ibiza at the time, and... Uh, it caught his eye and he shows us the the smugglers climbing the cliff face as he looks down. There's four of them. You can see three are near the top of the cliff and there's a fourth much further down, halfway up the cliff. The Interestingly, he uh, felt he needed to place the figures on the left, so he needed to extend the canvas and you can see the extension, the, the figure at the top of the cliff on the right, by his um, his left foot, the foot on the right, you can see the join in the canvas that's been painted over in order to extend it to the right and leave the painting more balanced. The paint, of course, is um, applied very vigorously. There's the deep, intense blue of the sea reflected in the blue of the white of the men's shirts. In other words, the men's shirts are um, white and but they are reflecting the blue of the sea. This is the final painting I'm going to cover and we return to Soraya's home in Madrid. It's called Garden of Soraya's House with Empty Chair. He's, he had travelled all over Spain capturing what became known as his Vision of Spain series a series of paintings that almost killed him with uh, exhaustion, the difficulty, intensity and constant travel between 1910 and 1920 led to him having a very serious stroke at this time, just after he painted this and he never painted again. The, um, the stroke, he had the stroke when he was at home and this is one of the last paintings he ever painted. We see the chair on which he often sat and painted and he died uh, three years later in 1923 and was buried like a, a Spanish state hero. His body was transported by cortege by train to Valencia, where thousands of people greeted it in his hometown. And he was buried with full state pomp. The... Um, let me just show you, let's just finish with um, a picture, not in exactly the same view, but to show you what the garden's like today. His great project to record Spain for posterity was over. It was installed in New York in 1926, but by that stage it was greeted with indifference. The world had changed. By the 1920s, when you thought of Spanish art, you thought of Dali, Miro, not of Soraya. All of those, all of the decades following um, Soraya has um, disappeared from view, and um, hopefully, this short talk has, and and the exhibition at the National Gallery in 2019 has helped to uh, restore him to his rightful place in the history of Spanish art.